the message and the spirit of the service is of such nature that I, I feel that uh, this message is the message that I'm supposed to bring tonight. And so you pray that, uh, that we'll not be entertained and enchanted but that will be changed Amen. by this message. Amen. This message is the message that changed, the making of this message changed my life. And all of the influence that I have had for the last 25 years, at least the last 25 years, came from... Um, the experience that I'm going to share with tonight. Amen. And so um, I, I've never gotten over this message. I never have. And so you pray tonight that the Lord will make a difference with you. Second chapter, the 14th verse, James 2.14, it says, What doth it profit, my brethren, Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? The Weymouth translation of that verse is, What does it profit, my brethren, for a man to say he hath faith and doth not have corresponding action? Can that faith save him? In other words, for you to say, I've got faith and do not have corresponding action, can that faith save you? James says it can't. He says it in a different way. He says faith without works is dead. He's not saying that works is dead. He's saying faith is dead. In other words, if you say, I've got faith and there's no works to show it, then it's dead. The faith is dead. There's no issue about it. Now, this interests me. I've heard this story told about a lot of people. But we'll just use Billy Graham since he's so popular. Back some years ago, Billy Graham was flying in a plane with a plane load of people. And uh, there was a man in the first class that was drinking and acting a fool like most drunks do. And, uh, and so the little lady in charge, you know, was trying to calm him down. He was being embarrassed. She was being embarrassed, not him. And Billy Graham being on there, that especially embarrassed her. So she thought she might use a little word or two to this drunk and calm him down a little bit. So she went up to him and said, Sir, I, I really wish you'd be quiet. Billy Graham is on this plane, and you're embarrassing me. He said, Billy Graham's on here. I've been wanting to meet Billy Graham. So he staggered back to Billy Graham, so drunk you could smell the liquor and you could see it that he was drunk. He stuck out his hands and he said, Mr. Graham, I've been wanting to meet you. He said, you saved me some years ago. Billy Graham said, I must have. Jesus didn't. <laughs> now what was he saying? He, he was simply saying that if you really have a faith in Jesus, it works. I've been preaching along that line every night. But he said it works. Now, Romans talks about a faith that saves without works because salvation is not of works at all. Faith in Jesus Christ this way saves us. We're saved without any works. We're simply saved by grace through faith. James is saying, though, when you have faith and it's real, it's genuine in Jesus. There's works that show the world Amen. that your faith is genuinely, genuinely real. Amen. Now tonight I want to talk to you about a type of faith that works. 
simple message, but something that so revolutionary it changed my life. And in the first chapter of James, the 16th verse, we have, uh, excuse me, the 22nd verse, we have these words, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For any if be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, and he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. Now I want to ask you a question tonight. This, by, this portion of scripture is talking about being a doer of the word of God. Now this is another way of talking to you about how to trust God. In the Old Testament, the word faith is not used but a couple of times. That's interesting. But when you get to the New Testament, the word faith is used most of the time instead of the Old Testament word. And the Old Testament word is obedience. But the New Testament word is faith. Now, we're talking about being a doer of the Word of God tonight. I mean, that's definitely the atmosphere, the spirit of this meeting is being a doer of the Word of God, and I'm going to talk about how can you be a doer of the Word of God? How can you be a doer of the Word of God? I got real interested one time with my mother-in-law about being a doer of the Word of God. This fascinated me. Uh, God, God dealt with my heart. My mother-in-law, I have a brother-in-law that's an pre- evangelist, and we were both in the same town. And she came to hear both of us preach. And she had some sweet thing to say about uh, my brother-in-law. And then when she got to me, she, uh, she said, Manly, you're too negative. <laughs> and I, I felt like she didn't understand my message and ministry. So I, I just thought I would uh, show her the difference between being positive and negative, how Jesus dealt with this issue. So I said to her, I said, Ms. Prince, the Bible says love your neighbor if your neighbor is your enemy as yourself. Right? She said, the Bible says that, yes. I said, all right, the Bible says, love your neighbor, your enemy, as yourself. Tell me, how are you going to love your enemy and neighbor as yourself? How are you going to do it? I mean, you're going to say, well... I'm going to read my Bible and <clears throat> you mean how to do it? Well, I'm going to pray. I- I'm going to pray and ask Jesus to help me. Is that going to do it? Now, how are you going to keep that commandment? Well, she finally said to me, she said, well, I I don't understand what you're talking about. That's about the best way out. (laughs) Do you understand what I'm talking about tonight? You've been hearing the word of God this week. The Bible says, be you a doer of the word and not a hearer only. The issue tonight is being a doer of the word of God. How are you going to be a doer of the word of God? There's only two ways out, work it out or faith it out. 
Amen. Now I'm going to talk to you tonight about how how you work it out or faith it out. Be ye a doer of the word and not a hearer only. I want to just throw this in as passing. I never realized this was in the Bible for years, but uh, this this blew my mind when I saw that it was in the Bible. Um, Matthew, the seventh chapter. You don't have to turn to it. I'll just read it to you. Therefore, whoso heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken to him. I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rocks descend, and the floods came, and the winds blew, beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. But every one of these that hear, every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, shall be likened to a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rains descend, and the floods came, and the winds blew, beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. You know, I've been singing a little song since I was two and three years old about building your house upon the rock and building your house upon the sand. But I never realized that there was such a profound promise in there, and it said, you hear these sayings of mine and doeth them not. You build your house upon the sand. And if you hear these sayings of mine and doeth them, you build your house upon the rock. And my dear friends, the definite, the Bible tells you, definitely the storm is going to come to every one of us and check our lives out as to see whether or not we have been, been doers of the Word of God or just simply hearers of the Word of God. Amen. Every one of us will have our lives tested, our families tested, and it's going to see, it's going to tell whether or not we built upon the rock or built upon the sand. Now, how do you build on the rock? How do you build on the sand? By being a doer of the Word of God, you build upon the rock. And by being a hearer of the Word and not a doer, you build up on the sand. I never realized that tied in together. But that's what we're talking about tonight, being a doer of the Word of God. Now, let me tell you something. I'm going to make the deepest statement I will make while I'm here in this meeting. It's the simplest, the deepest, and probably the most significant, and I'll tell you, I'm telling you that because I want you to hear it, and when you find out, write and tell me about it. The only way in the world you can be a doer of the Word of God is by choice. The only way in the world you can be a doer of the Word of God is by choice. There's no other way. There's no other way to keep the Word of God but by choice. Now, I I said that uh, yesterday morning when I defined the grace of faith. It's all reduced to a choice. That's the only way you can do it, is by choice. Now, when you make that choice, your whole body responds and cooperates with that choice. But it's by choice. By being a doer of the Word of God. The only way you can be a doer of the Word of God is by choice. Now, I realize there needs a lot of explanations, but uh, you'd be here half the night trying to give somebody an explanation they're trying to understand and my dear friends not pay the price to get the message from God uh, so you wouldn't be any better off anyway. But I'm saying the only way is by choice. Is by choice. Now I want to tell you a humor story. A true story, but it's a humor story. But all, all these years, if I've had any influence in this area, my dear friends, it was learned at this experience I had. I went to an old-fashioned camp meeting in South Carolina back years ago. Twenty-one, two, three, year, about 23 years ago. I went to this old-fashioned camp meeting. And I got to this camp meeting and they were singing and shouting. 
And I was used to shouting a little bit, but I, I, I never saw such shouting, about 2,000 people just shouting, especially like this. They, I never seen shouting like this. That was one man that had a baby on his hip, and he'd run up and down the aisle shouting. I mean with a baby on his hip, holding that baby with one arm and just a shout. He'd run down that aisle and he'd run up on the piano and then he'd run the choir rail. That choir rail was a two by four. He'd run that choir rail, he'd come up on the piano, he'd go down the choir rail and he'd go down the organ and he'd shout all the way back up the other aisle with that baby. I mean, folk, he was cutting it up. And there was another fella in that same meeting that he'd run up and down the aisles and fall down in the, in the ground and pick up a bunch of shavings. They had the floor covered with, uh, the ground covered with wood shavings. He'd throw those shavings up, they'd go everywhere. And, uh, and then there was one more fella I'll never forget. He would climb the post in there, and I mean they were shouting. But that, about 2,000 people, they would shout, and I mean they would shout, and they would shout, and they would shout. And you said, Brother Manley, I, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, I don't know that I ask you your opinion, did I? Did I? Amen. You might, you, I don't, you might ought to keep your opinion to yourself. That's what I was trying to do that night. I was sitting over there, and I was trying to keep my opinion to myself. And I was sitting over there by an old friend, now in glory, Curtis McCarley. And old brother Curtis was going to be the preacher for that crowd the next week. And there they were, and boy, they were shouting it out, singing and a-shouting, singing and a-shouting. And then all at once they stopped their singing after about an hour, and they said, now we're going to take an offering. And I want you to know, friends, I'm not blind. It got quiet. It got, it got quiet as all life. It got quiet. Now, when it got quiet, I, I said in my heart, I kept from making an opinion up to this point, but I said this bunch, is nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. <laughs> and that fellow got up there, oh, I never will forget Kelly. Oh, Billy Kelly, that was his name, big as a pulpit. He said, who'll give a hundred? Who'll give a hundred? Who'll give a hundred? I thought, I said to myself, I said, my stars, I'm at an auction. I said, I'm at an auction. Who'll give a hundred? Who'll give a hundred? Who'll give a hundred? And then they came down. Then they said, who'll give 50? Who'll give 50? And then they came, who'll give 20? Who'll give 20? I mean, I really sound like I was in an auction. And there's about 2,000 people there. And I mean, there they were begging for money. And they were just begging up a storm for money. Now, <clears throat> I was sitting over there, and I had $8 in my pocket. That's all I had. I had $8 in my pocket, no credit cards, no, no check, just $8. And I had gone off from home and left my shaving kit. And I had plans for that $8. I knew that I could replenish my shaving kit, get a new one for $8. And I had plans for that shave at $8. But I, I, I wasn't too spiritual, but I was spiritual enough, my dear friends, to know that when the offering plate is passed, you don't reach in your pocket and get a dollar bill and throw it in there like a heathen. Amen. Amen. And, I, and I knew something else. Now, I wouldn't call this fellow heathen, but that last act is heathenistic. Yes, amen. amen. But I, I wouldn't call this one heathenistic. Uh, I, I'd also learned that you just don't throw in uh, what you want to right. right off the bat. You ask God what to do. So I was sitting there, and I, I said, God, I was, I was trying to act like a Christian. I said, God, I said, I've got to have part of this money tomorrow. And I said, I, I'll, give, uh, I, I'll give you three, and I'll keep the five. And God didn't say anything. Now, folk, when God gets silent, it means it's your next move. It's not his. <laughs> Amen. Yes, I read. And so I, I just said, okay, God, I will give the three and I'll keep the five and give you the three. God didn't say a word. 
So then I said, okay, Lord, if that won't suit your plans, then I will give the five and keep the three. And God still didn't say anything. God just kept quiet. Well, about that time, they said, now we have a, a friend here tonight visiting, and he is going to come up here and thank God for this offering. Brother Manley, would you come to the pulpit and thank God for this offering? Now, boy, back in those days, I was mean. Wasn't I, Brother Sonny? I was awfully mean. And I mean mean. And man, I got up there and I said, now let me tell you something. I said, God didn't take this offering and I'm not going to thank him for it. That's right. That's right. That's what I told him. Now, I had already thought over there in that seat. I said, what these people need is to understand that whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now, what did I mean by that? I meant, my dear friends, that the, the faith life is that you allow God to initiate what you do. And what God calls on you to do, it takes the supernatural power of God to do it. And I said, these people need to understand about faith. So I got up there and I said, now, folk, God didn't take this offering and I'm not going to thank him. I said, what would really honor God here tonight would be for you to bow your head and ask God what to do and in your heart make the choice to do it when God tells you, do it. So I got a little encouragement, and I said, how many of you believe God performs miracles tonight like he did in the days of the New Testament? Hey. And friend, they started shouting. Hey. Well, I knew I had them going my way then. <laughs> they, they, started, they, they started praising God. And then I said, how many of you believe God performs miracles today just like he did in the days of George Miller when one morning he came down in 2,000 orphans, had no breakfast, and he told them, said, turn your plates over and let's bow our heads and thank Jesus for breakfast when there wasn't a mouthful in the building. And they prayed, folk. And when they got through praying, there was a knock on the door. And they went to the door and there, were, there was wagon loads of hot cooked breakfast ready to eat. A catering service had been hired to furnished breakfast for this occasion and they got to the place and it was the wrong day. And the man running the catering service said this food is cooked and ready. It'd be a shame to waste it. Let's drive it by the orphanage. Hey. How many of you believe God performed miracles tonight like that? Amen, Amen brother. <laughs> I'll tell you, they shouted again. They went at it, boy. They just shouted. They, I mean, they shouted. And so, and I knew I had them. That's just where I wanted them. I said, now, you know what a faith offering is? I said, a faith offering is bowing your head and asking God what to do. And then when God shows you what to do on the basis of that revelation, make the choice and do it. Amen. Now, folks, that's the definition of faith. When you have the Word of God, the only way you can obey that word is by choice. Amen. It's not deep, that's just simply the truth. Amen. But it's so simple, we miss it. And my dear friends, I, I told them, I said, if you're not a bunch of shouting hypocrites, bless God, you'll do something about it. I was ugly, I was ugly, I, I was stirred up. <laughs> But God calmed my ugliness down because I tell you, I saw some of those dear old saints come walking down those aisles, tears trickling down their cheeks, started dropping those checks in the offering plate, and I'm going to carry this on through. <clears throat> Next week, Brother Curtis preached there, and 
He said, Brother Manley, those people would stop me from preaching. Some of them have been saved 40 and 50 years. And say, say, Brother Curtis, last Saturday night, God told me to put my grocer check in. And I put it in. I obeyed God. And we, didn't, we were trusting God this week for the first time in our life. And God, on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday, God did this miracle, and God did this miracle, and God did this miracle. And he couldn't hardly preach that week because of the supernatural manifestation of God in those dear old... He hadn't had salvation and manifestation of God. Their lives had been saved. And I stand there watching God said to me, $8. I said, to get me in the morning. I said, borrow a razor. I can borrow everything but a toothbrush. He said, eight dollars. <laughs> and my dear friends, I put that, I never will forget it. Put that eight dollars in. And a man came up to me and said, Preacher, I hope you won't think I'm stupid. But he said, The Lord has impressed me that you need some shaving equipment. And he's some equipment, kit, all equipment a man needs. I want you to tap it with the equipment. Praise the Praise. And uh, when I got to my room that night, there was over $40 in my pockets. And here's what happened, folks. I quoted those people. Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. With the same measure that you measure out, it shall be measured to you again. I asked him, how many of you believe? I said, then ask who can be a doer of that word. How could they be a doer of that word? By a choice in their heart to give. And they did it. And God met with them. And then God said, eight dollars. And I obeyed God. And from that day to this day, my dear friends, it has revolutionized my life about giving. Amen. And across this country, and I'm, I'm not going to tell it tonight, but I can show you how, it, how what God taught me in that old-fashioned camp meeting that night has revolutionized Baptists and their giving. Now, you wouldn't believe it unless I told you the story. Amen. But I can take you to the churches that are today raising millions and millions on the basis of the principle God taught me that night, Amen. and I've taught it to other people. Now, I'm telling you the truth, and it started out with $8. Amen. But I learned something that night. I learned that you can be a doer of the Word of God yes, and not just a hearer only. Now, my friends, it's not enough this week that you hear the Word of God. Right. It's not enough that you hear the Word. It's not, enough that, it's not enough that you feel the warmth and the expressions that you feel down here. It's important. It's necessary. It's absolutely imperative that you become a doer of the Word hey. of God. Hey. Not just to hear only, but a doer of the Word of the living God. My life changed that night, and I never knew it till years later. And I look back on it tonight, after probably 23 years, and it was one of the most significant occasions, not the most, but one of the most significant occasions in my entire life. Yes, sir. It taught me how to be a doer of the Word and not a hearer only. One of these days, the storm is going to come on your life. It's coming. One of these days, the storm will come and hit your life. It's coming. And if you've been a doer of the Word, you've built your house on a rock. But if you've been just a hearer and not a doer, you've built your house on the sand. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. The rains will descend and great will be the fall of your house. Amen. Amen.
It's coming. And the only way to be prepared for it is be a doer of the word of the living God. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Brother Jimmy?